Welcome to today's webinar. We're really excited to have you here. Today, we are here for Narcolepsy and Women's Health, a wake-up call. I'm Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research. And SWHR is the thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving women's health through science policy and education. Narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder that affects the brain's ability to regulate sleep-wake cycles, resulting in persistent and excessive daytime sleepiness, and in some cases, cataplexy, which is a sudden change in muscle tone in one or more parts of the body. While men and women experience similar symptoms, it can take up to an additional 12 years for women to arrive at an accurate narcolepsy diagnosis compared to men. Narcolepsy can present significant challenges to daily living, including managing employment, school, and relationships. However, with proper treatment, symptoms can be stabilized and even improve over time. And today, we're pleased to have three amazing panelists join us for our event to share their expertise about narcolepsy in women's health. Dr. Vidya Krishnan, Associate Professor of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University Metro Health Campus. Dr. Michael Grandner, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Arizona, and Tove Marin Stakestad, a patient advocate and writer of Mama in the Now. I'd like to also thank the sponsors of today's event, Avidel and Harmony Biosciences. And as always, we are live tweeting during this event. We invite you to use the hashtag SWHRTalkSleep on all social media. And with that, at this time, I'd like to introduce SWHR's Chief Science Officer, Dr. Irene Aninye, who is moderating today's event. Thank you, Katie, and welcome everyone. On average, individuals spend 26 years of their lives asleep and seven years trying to fall asleep. Sleep is an essential function for overall health and well being, and it aids in the body's ability to maintain proper brain function and physical health. Poor sleep and sleep disorders are often unrecognized and underreported and incur high economic burden. SWHR's narcolepsy program was established to address barriers to care in science, education, and policy related to narcolepsy in women. We have assembled a working group of researchers and healthcare providers with expertise in sleep health and neurology, patients and patients advocates, and healthcare decision makers who are committed to improving care for women living with narcolepsy across the lifespan. With the guidance of the experts in our narcolepsy working group, SWHR has developed a patient toolkit to help women living with narcolepsy navigate their care. Raising awareness and improving access to information about sleep health and narcolepsy can help reduce stigma surrounding this condition and better prepare women and their healthcare providers to address potential challenges throughout their life course and maintain a full and high quality of life. Today, we have three members of the working group with us to highlight information found in the toolkit and share their insights as to how we can better understand narcolepsy recognize the symptoms, and manage care from both clinical and patient perspectives. Following the speaker presentations, I'll be moderating a discussion with all of our panelists, so we invite you to use the Q&A function to submit questions throughout the event. Please note that our resources and conversation today are intended for educational purposes and not intended or implied to serve as a substitute for medical or professional advice. We encourage all patients and consumers to confirm information and consult their healthcare provider to, to determine their individual needs. I'll now introduce Dr. Vidya Krishnan, who will start us off with an introduction about sleep health and understanding the risk factors and common symptoms of narcolepsy. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Krishnan. Thanks, Irene. Uh, welcome everyone. and. I will get my slides up and we can get started. I'm not seeing the slides. Uh, can I please get some help? Thank you. Um, so uh, since I guess I last wrote that introduction, I am actually now a professor at the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And the topic I'm gonna to talk about here is sleep health um, and how it relates to narcolepsy in particular. Next slide. 
So we all sleep. That's sort of a commonality amongst all of us. As mentioned, we spend about a third of our life sleeping. It's an essential function for overall health and well-being, and it aids in our body's ability to maintain proper brain and physical health. Some of the interesting statistics around sleep is that 70 million Americans suffer from chronic sleep disorders, uh, insomnia being the most common. 80% of sleep disorders go undetected or undiagnosed. And about $411 billion is lost to productivity due to sleep disorders each year. Next slide. So how much should we sleep? Uh, the recommended amount of sleep really varies by age. Babies, as many of you know, sleep all through the day and night, up to 14 to 17 hours in a 24 hour period. By about age five or six, we've consolidated our sleep uh, into mostly nocturnal sleep, but still require 10 to 13 hours of sleep. By adulthood, we've consolidated to nighttime sleep uh, and seven to nine hours is generally considered healthy amount of sleep. But this is not always achieved because we are increasingly subjected to shorter and uh, more stresses in our life, including shift work, long work hours, daylight savings time, which we thankfully got rid of this weekend, uh, jet lag, and excessive screen time. Next slide. In women, sleep disorders can be uh, a challenge because they present differently than men. Sleep disorders disproportionately and differently affect women compared to men, in part due to menstruation, pregnancy, and menopause. Women are more likely to report higher levels of daytime sleepiness, but also feeling unrefreshed in the morning after a night of sleep, increased use of sleep medications, and lower sleep quality. Next slide. What is narcolepsy? As mentioned in the introduction, it's a chronic neurologic disorder that affects the brain's ability to regulate sleep-wake cycles and results in excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy, which I'll define in a bit. About 130 to 200,000 individuals in the United States have been diagnosed with narcolepsy. We generally categorize narcolepsy into two types. Type one, which occurs in patients who have excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy, and type two, which occurs without the cataplexy. Next slide. The way that normal sleep is regulated, we have two factors that affect our ability to sleep. The first is the homeostatic drive, which is the easiest to explain. It just means the longer that we're awake, the more likely we are to fall asleep. So theoretically, after we wake up should be our most alert during the day. And as we go through our day, we get sleepier to the point by evening or nighttime, we're ready to sleep. This homeostatic drive is what regulates non-rapid eye movement or non-REM sleep. The other factor is circadian sleep rhythm which is regulated by a natural hormone, melatonin, um, and undulates in a cycle where once melatonin is secreted in the evening time, that signals our body that it's time to sleep. And this is a regular um, cycle that happens day and night. So when both the, I'm sorry, and the circadian rhythm is tied to rapid eye movement or REM sleep. And when both the circadian rhythm and the homeostatic drive are at its peak is when we're most, most likely to fall asleep. Next slide. The normal sleep pattern for an adult is that we consolidate our sleep at night. In the evening time, our homeostatic and circadian rhythm drives are at its peak and we're able to fall asleep first into light non-REM sleep, then into deep non-REM sleep, and then finally, we cycle into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and then lighten up our sleep back into light non-REM. 
This cycle is about 90 minutes, and we have three or four cycles throughout the night as we sleep. And it's regular to wake up even once or twice at night as long as we're able to fall asleep quickly. Next slide. This is how narcoleptic patients sleep. They have dysregulated sleep through day and night. You see in the nighttime, their sleep is disordered. They don't necessarily go through the natural stage uh, progression from light non-REM to deep non-REM to REM sleep. Uh, it's really quite haphazard. They have periods during the day when they're likely to fall asleep rapidly and into deep stages of sleep and including rapid eye movement sleep periodically throughout the day. Next slide. And some of the um, risk factors and common symptoms that we think about with narcolepsy. Uh, age is not necessarily a risk factor since we've all been 10 years old uh, at some point in our life on this uh, webinar, but 10 to 20 years old represents the usual age where symptoms of narcolepsy tend to present. Not necessarily diagnosed, but when the symptoms actually start. Family history can be a risk factor for narcolepsy. The prevalence of narcolepsy in the U.S. is about 25 to 50 per 100,000 in the population. But people who have first-degree relatives with narcolepsy have a prevalence more on the order of 1,000 to 2,000 per 100,000, or 1 to 2 percent. So it's still not common to have narcolepsy if you have a first-degree relative with it, but it's much more likely. Immune and environmental triggers have been uh, implicated in the development of narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is thought to be an autoimmune disorder that attack where autoimmune factors attack the anterior hypothalamus in the brain and destroy the cells that secrete hypocretin uh, or also called orexin. Environmental triggers may also play a role in the development of narcolepsy. Exposure to certain neurotoxins might have a role, um, but these studies have been somewhat difficult because those exposures likely happen before you know, narcolepsy presents. So at a very young age, going backwards to seeing what patients are exposed to has posed some challenges in this area of research. And finally, brain trauma and infection um, may also affect areas of the sleep-wake uh, control in the brain and contribute to an increased risk of narcolepsy. What are the common symptoms that we see in patients with narcolepsy? We've mentioned excessive daytime sleepiness. They can have sudden attacks of sleep, as we saw in the hypnogram of how a typical day and night in a narcolepsy patient is. They can develop sleep paralysis, which is a condition as they're waking up or as they're falling asleep, they know they're awake, but they can't move. Their muscles are paralyzed. It can be quite scary. They um, may say it lasts minutes and it resolves on its own. Uh, they're awake through this and they're able to see what's going on in the room. There's changes in REM sleep in that REM sleep occurs earlier in the night, occurs uh, even during the daytime naps that they take or sleep attacks that they have. They may present with hallucinations and these are also in the same time uh, frame as they're falling asleep, as they're waking up. They're in that transition between sleep and wake. They know they're awake, but they see or hear things in the room that may not be there. And often they're familiar faces, familiar voices. They can have disturbed nighttime sleep or even insomnia paradoxically in these patients at nighttime. And then this term cataplexy that I've mentioned, which is really the complete loss of muscle tone um, or partial loss of muscle tone and it's usually triggered by a strong emotion. So when we're laughing or get scared, all of a sudden the central muscles 
get weak. So perhaps the neck might nod or the knees might buckle or a narcolepsy patient may actually completely drop to the floor and they don't lose consciousness. Uh, it usually is a self-limited minutes type of occasion uh, and they will be able to uh, recover spontaneously. So those are some of the features we're looking for in patients with narcolepsy. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan, uh, and congratulations on the professorship. Next, we'll have Dr. Michael Grandner discuss managing your narcolepsy care, where he'll highlight the diagnostic process, various treatment options across the lifespan, and other health conditions that often affect women living with narcolepsy. Hi, well, thank you. Hi, thank you for, for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be presenting to this group. Um, so let me talk a little bit about this issue. So first, a little bit about how narcolepsy is diagnosed. Uh, a narcolepsy diagnosis can sometimes be made just really on the presence of excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy, but the diagnosis often requires a few things, including a physical exam um, where you can we can check out other conditions, potentially rule out other contributors. Uh, a sleep history evaluation, and what that means is talking with um, a sleep provider to go through the timeline of the issues, how long they've gone on, how they've changed over time, what they look like, asking questions to probe um, what, uh, what may be going on and, and what condition this might be, including narcolepsy. And then a sleep study. And so a, a sleep study in the case of narcolepsy is a little different than typical, uh, but I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. It's worth noting from a symptom perspective, about 75% of people with narcolepsy have cataplexy, but that means a quarter of them don't. Uh, it also means that many of the people who do have cataplexy might not even realize it because the effects might be more subtle or they might think that it's something else. And this creates problems where of, of, of a diagnostic delay. So that means people are having the condition for a long time before it ever gets treated. Um, women tend to be diagnosed on average 28 years after the symptoms actually started. It just takes that long to identify, yes, in fact, this is narcolepsy, let's get you an adequate treatment. And that is 12 years longer than it takes for men on average, which is still much too long. Um, but it does take longer women. Part of that has to do with how often uh, narcolepsy might be misdiagnosed. Um, most commonly, when people present with the symptoms that end up being narcolepsy, uh, when people don't know to look for, for narcolepsy-related symptoms, they might mistake this for some sort of mood disorder or some sort of behavioral issue or poor sleep hygiene or your, your crazy schedule or something. Um, often it's mistaken for insomnia or, or even sleep deprivation and insufficient sleep. Uh, it often gets misdiagnosed as some sort of ADHD or depression or anxiety disorder. And it can go on like that for a long time before the, the actual narcolepsy becomes appropriately diagnosed. And in terms of that diagnosis, a sleep study for narcolepsy um, actually has usually two parts. The first is the overnight sleep study that most people are familiar with, the polysomnogram or PSG. Uh, the polysomnogram, this is where you sleep in the lab with all the sensors connected to you. Um, it's reporting mostly brain activity, but also muscle activity, breathing, eye movements, um, and other things too, including heart rate and things like that. Uh, this will determine not only what your sleep looks like, whether you're awake or asleep and have awakenings, and it'll also look at all your sleep stages throughout the night. Um, and for the case of narcolepsy, it's really important to look to see where REM sleep occurs during the night. After that PSG, that night, that next day, you stay in the lab for something called a multiple sleep latency test or MSLT. So what the multiple sleep latency test is, you'll think about the name, multiple sleep latency test. So multiple means there's multiple. Sleep latency means how long it takes you to fall asleep. So you try falling asleep a few different times across the day. Usually it's five different nap opportunities spread two hours apart from each other across the day where you're still hooked up to everything in the lab and they say, try falling asleep and they see how long it takes you to fall asleep. Um, if it only takes a few minutes or if it takes a very long time. Um, and so this test looks to see 
how quickly can you fall asleep at each of those different intervals? And how quickly do you enter REM sleep during those intervals? Because that can also give an indication of different sleep disorders, including narcolepsy. And also it's important that there's a urine toxicology screen so that they can rule out that any of these sleep effects are, are due to any other um, contributors. Before you come into the lab, actually there's another measurement that's often done at home before you even get to the lab. And this is where uh, they give you some sort of a sleep log or sleep diary because narcolepsy is something that happens in real life, very day to day. And just because you're in the lab for one night, it might not uh, capture a complete picture of what your experience is. So what this is doing is trying to find a simple way to capture what the experience is like in real life. It keeps a record of your sleep habits. It'll review um, your medications and when you're taking them. Um, and, and it will ask you to follow your regular routine as much as you can up to the point you come into the lab. So not only can the, the, the team get a view on what your sleep habits are, but also what they can do is make sure that their assessment is looking at your sleep um, in a normal context um, where you can imagine if you've had the worst week of sleep ever and then you come into the lab or the best week of sleep ever before you come into the lab, that will look differently. So that's what this is for. In terms of the treatments for narcolepsy, unfortunately, there is no cure where you do this and then you never have it again. But there are treatments. Symptoms can be stabilized and even improved over time. Uh, and there are two groups of treatments. There's the medical therapies and lifestyle approaches. Most patients, um, nearly all patients, need at least some medical therapy for their narcolepsy. One of the main treatments are, are wake-promoting medications, which aren't stimulants, but then also stimulants are sometimes used as well to help keep you awake during the day as safely as possible so that it uh, keeps you optimally functional. And that can also have the additional effect of improving your sleep at night and helping to consolidate that. Uh, so in addition to wake promoting medications and stimulants, um, another class of medications is sodium oxabate and, and related medications. And, and these are taken at night to help consolidate your sleep. It's not like a sleeping pill, it actually works in a very different way, um, but it does consolidate sleep at night in people with narcolepsy, which then helps them also okay. function during the day. Also, it's worth noting that certain antidepressants, because of how they work in the brain, can also be effective oh, yeah. for uh, narcolepsy as well as, um, as a treatment or an add-on. In addition to these medical treatments, there's a number of lifestyle approaches that um, can help uh, with narcolepsy. The most common being, uh, scheduled short naps of maybe only 15 to 20 minutes. But if you can plan for these naps ahead of time and schedule them out, what you can do is you can make getting through the day more manageable so that um, your sleep drive is, doesn't interfere as much in daytime activities. Also keeping a consistent sleep schedule, um, getting enough daily exercise and engaging in stress reduction techniques can help um, supplement whatever else you're doing uh, to help manage symptoms. And actually, these are all things that have shown that you can improve outcomes. So in terms of managing um, comorbidities, so what comorbidities refer to are um, conditions that co-occur with narcolepsy. Some of the most common include other sleep disorders like insomnia, sleep apnea, um, but also mental health disorders like depression and anxiety do often co-occur with narcolepsy for many reasons. In addition, uh, people with narcolepsy can also have cardiovascular and, and metabolic conditions that also require treatment that might be related to the condition and other neurologic disorders as well. So narcolepsy can be complicated and, and overlap with some of these conditions. And that's why the narcolepsy care team might have the sleep specialist and neurologist at the core, but might also really include mental health professional, cardiologist, dietitian or nutritionist, uh, an ENT provider or an endocrinologist or a pulmonologist, depending on what other conditions are, are going along with the narcolepsy. So, so narcolepsy can be very multifaceted uh, and require input from a number of different specialties to make sure people are optimally taken care of. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And I would like to note that those that are tuned in live can submit questions at any time 
using the Q&A function, and we will try to address as many of them as we can during the panel discussion portion of the event. I'll now invite Tova um, Stackestead, who will share her personal journey, insights, and tips for living well with narcolepsy. Thank you, Tova. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. So my name is Tova Stackstead. I'm a writer at Mama in the Now, and I will be your face of narcolepsy today. Um, personally, everything that was discussed um, today has really been my experience. I was diagnosed in 2004, approximately, at 30 years old with narcolepsy uh, type 1. But I had symptoms pretty much throughout my ent entire childhood. So the stat we heard about 28 years from uh, symptom onset to diagnosis is about uh, correct for my personal experience. Growing up, I had excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, cataplexy, sleep paralysis, and automatic behavior. Um, all those things were misdiagnosed throughout my life. It's not like my parents never took me to the doctor or questioned any of these uh, symptoms. They were just misdiagnosed. So I was um, told I had anemia, and that would probably explain my excessive daytime sleepiness. The childhood epilepsy turned out probably to be cataplexy. And then throughout the years, um, several times when I went to the doctor and expressed how tired I was, I was told uh, it was probably a depression or a, some kind of hormonal imbalance, which goes along with the things that women most commonly are told when they go to the doctor with these very common symptoms. Um, I have then, since I was diagnosed, I uh, became a mother to four boys. So I have a very active life right now. I worked full time through my pregnancies and I managed to breastfeed all four babies, which are concerns that I hear from a lot of women with narcolepsy as they enter into motherhood. They are concerned, will they be able to work? Will they be able to breastfeed? And for me, that was, um, I was able to do all those things, um, which I'll go into um, a little bit more detail. Um, next slide, please. So some of the things that narcolepsy has taught me. Personally, for me, as we heard for a lot of people with narcolepsy, stress is a trigger. And stress is really one of my biggest triggers. So I have sort of coined the phrase of unapologetic self-care. A lot of times I have to say no, I have to turn down invitations, I have to say no, not today, I can't do this, or reschedule things when I feel like my calendar gets too full, and I just have to do it. Um, I have learned to live a much healthier life, um, improve my diet, uh, and um, exercise, nothing big or strenuous, just uh, walking the dog, doing a little bit of yoga at home, again, don't want to add um, an exercise routine that causes stress and causes you to just have one more thing to do. Um, but then I've also learned to prioritize sleep hygiene. Um, something a lot of women do, probably a lot of mothers, once the family goes to bed, we sort of get a second wind and uh, start reorganizing the, the spice cabinet or whatever have you. And I have learned to, when I start to feel tired, I go to bed, I read a book, and that's it. Could I do more with my time? Oh yeah, I definitely could, as all mothers could. When the house is quiet, that's our time to get things done. But I have learned that it's very important for me and for people with narcolepsy to really listen to your body. When you feel that tiredness, go to bed. Um, I focus a lot on self-care and self-advocacy. Um, and what that looks like for me is I'm very open about my diagnosis. I am generally um, the one token friend um, in, in my friend group of the person with narcolepsy. Most people don't know a lot of people with narcolepsy because for some reason, people keep it to themselves. They, they don't want to share their diagnosis. And I feel like with the latest trend of putting mental health in the forefront of um, the importance of health. It's made it a little bit easier for me to, to share my um, 
diagnosis of narcolepsy and I'm I have no problems with it I it might be the first thing you ever hear about me when you meet me just to so I can reduce my stress um, and then also not over committing my schedule that's uh, one thing I'm constantly working on you can ask my husband um, I'm working really hard not to overcommit myself um, but that is a, a a daily thing. Um, and then naps. Naps have um, naps happen every day. I have learned to manage my narcolepsy really well, but naps are a constant um, presence in my life. Uh, next slide, please. So as you are diagnosed and as you meet with your provider, you will probably go through a slew of providers in your journey with narcolepsy. Um, meeting the right person is, is almost like dating or finding a good friend. You need to find a doctor who not only understands narcolepsy, but understands who you are and understands your lifestyle and your lifestyle priorities. So conversations to have with your provider. And this provider might be a sleep specialist, might be a neurologist, might be a pulmonologist just someone who really understands narcolepsy. Uh, questions to ask them is, how can narcolepsy affect my long-term health? And only someone who truly sees the holistic full picture of your health will be able to answer that question. And it looks different for every person with narcolepsy. Um, how can narcolepsy affect my lifestyle? That's also something um, your provider needs to know about you, needs to know where you are in your, in your years of, you know, do you want to have a family? Are you planning on having more kids? Are you planning on not having kids? If you're not planning on having kids, is that something that we need to talk about too? Um, how can I manage my narcolepsy symptoms? As we heard, a lot of times medication is necessary, but also lifestyle changes are necessary. And it's not necessarily uh, one or the other, it's both things will work together hand in hand. Um, what medications do you recommend I try first and why? A lot of times um, providers have a, a different regimen of medicine that they like to try. And then they sort of have a, a list that they you need to work your way through. A lot of times that is also affected by what's covered by your insurance. So those are things, those are conversations to have with your medical professional. Uh, if they recommend something you take during the night or if you, they recommend daytime stimulants. Um, and what risk does narcolepsy pose to pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding? So when I had my kids, which was uh, 15, 16 years ago, uh, my medical professionals didn't know a lot about uh, medications and how they would affect pregnancy. So I was just recommended to get off all medications. And at the time I was taking stimulants. So I did. Um, and I learned to manage my narcolepsy without medication. Um, I don't advise it for everybody, but I also did take a lot of big lifestyle changes, career changes for me, which in hindsight didn't turn out to be a bad thing, but it did require a lot of lifestyle changes. So those are conversations to have with your medical professional. And then also, can you recommend some resources that can help me talk to friends, family, spouses, employers about narcolepsy. So I would say that has probably been personally for me, very, very important. There's always Facebook groups, but some uh, locations have support groups for people with narcolepsy, but then also for loved ones um, of patients with narcolepsy. So that would be a great resource for your loved ones to learn what having narcolepsy means to you without necessarily you having to tell them that. Uh, next slide, please. And then deciding on a treatment plan. Again, that is something you'll be doing with your medical professional. And some of the things that they take into consideration and that you should take into consideration too is your age. Are you of childbearing age? Are you going into menopause? Have you already gone through menopause? 
um, your lifestyle and activity levels. Are you wanting to hike a mountain every week or are you more of a homebody? Um, do you run after your kids all day long or do you work in an office? What does your lifestyle look like? And all these things are different for every single person. There's not a one size fits all. Uh, symptom management. Uh, do you have debilitating ca uh, cataplexy or is your cataplexy just a quick little knee buckle here and then? Um, family planning goals, those are very important to take into consideration. Um, treatment effectiveness and side effects. Um, personally, for me, I didn't uh, like how the stimulants made me feel. Um, and so that was also why it wasn't hard for me to get off uh, the medication. But sometimes the side effects are mild and people can motor on through. So those are all very good conversations to have. Uh, other health risk factors, as we heard, there could be other medical conditions going along um, with your narcolepsy, um, thyroid issues, uh, hormone issues, uh, cardi cardiovascular issues. So those are all things that need to be taken into consideration with regard to your medication and see how anything that you're taking now is affected by any medications to help you with your narcolepsy. And of course, health insurance coverage. That is always very important because these medications can really uh, break the bank, so to speak. Uh, next slide, please. So living well with narcolepsy is 110% possible. Um, as we heard today, there is no cure for narcolepsy, but that doesn't mean that it can't be managed. Um, managing narcolepsy is a fluid situation and it changes throughout your life, lifespan. I can tell over the past 16, 17 years that I've been diagnosed, my narcolepsy has changed a lot. And from what I heard from my medical professionals, it has probably peaked and at this point, where I am now is probably the way it'll be for, for many years in the foreseeable future. Uh, for me, I have learned to manage it, but it takes a village. And that village will include your medical professional, your friends and family, your partner, and your employer. So what I always recommend to people is um, learn to, to share your experience about narcolepsy, openly with your friends and family so they can learn to understand what it means to you because they don't know. And if they don't know, they're going to make assumptions. And quite honestly, those assumptions will probably always be wrong. So sharing how what narcolepsy means to you and how it makes you feel is uh, really helpful. Also, um, communicate openly. So personally for me, um, meetings are my trigger. So it, it doesn't matter the topic, it doesn't matter the size of the meeting. If I am entering into a group setting and it's called a meeting, I will, I will fall asleep. So I have learned to walk up to the presenter or whoever is running the meeting, introduce myself and tell them that I have narcolepsy. And it, should I happen to get a sleep attack and fall asleep during the meeting, it is no indication of my level of interest in the topic at hand. It simply just means I have narcolepsy. And more times than not, I have, I've always been met with very positive feedback from people, but I even one time had a presenter just look at me and say, wow, my child was just diagnosed with narcolepsy. I can't believe I'm meeting someone else. So you never know where your advocacy, how, where that can take you and where you could actually end up helping someone else. And then lastly, to live well with narcolepsy, and this is a tough one, especially for a lot of women, is learning to ask for help. It's not easy, but it is necessary, especially as um, we go through motherhood, um, learning to ask for help uh, specifically, um, saying, hey, I need help. Can you help me pick up the kids? Or you know, I would love if somebody would come help me do the laundry, but that's not going to happen. But learning to ask for help is very, very helpful and important. So with that, I want to thank you. Thank you, Tova. And thank you all for sharing and setting the stage for the Q&A portion of this event. 
I invite you, the panelists, to turn on their cameras. And so during this portion, we are welcoming attendees to submit questions using the Q&A function, which is usually at the bottom of your screen. We will try to address as many individual questions and common themes as we can um, over the next 10 or 15 minutes, but we do apologize in advance if we're not able to get to them all. And so to open the conversation, let's say, um, I'd imagine that, you know, the conversation about disordered sleep will often start in a primary care provider's office, you know, during a checkup or something. And so what advice would um, you give to women or their PCP to have a productive conversation about their sleep health? in recognizing warning signs of a potential disorder like narcolepsy. And so I said, maybe Tova, you might be able to talk a bit about your, um, what it was like to go through that process, that diagnostic process, and then maybe uh, Michael and Vidya can weigh in on the clinical side. Yeah, it was it was actually interesting. The way I was diagnosed was from a general practitioner who happened to, um, she had run a gamut of, of blood tests and it turned out I didn't, you know, I thought it was just um, deficient in some vitamins or, or something and that would explain why I kept falling asleep in, at work. And um, she said, well, you know what, I think I have read a little bit about narcolepsy. Um, in my uh, medical studies. And she showed me a, a printout and she said, does this look like something? And, and it was about narcolepsy. This was back when, you know, you didn't just have the internet on your phone. And, and I just started crying because every single symptom uh, fit perfectly with my experience. So she was, it was a general practitioner who ended up uh, diagnosing me, which is, is very unusual, but um, just the fact that she had run all the blood tests and nothing else fit, she was willing to, to go out on a limb and say, I think you need a sleep study, um, which I'm very, very thankful for. <laughs> so one, one thing that I wanna say, um, just to build off of that, which which I think is, is, is makes a, a few really good points is that patients shouldn't, need to know everything about how to identify and diagnose the entire book of sleep disorders and primary care practitioners are not going to either. So now what? I think maybe the solution is that patients need to be armed with the information of if you're suspecting that something is wrong with your sleep or if you can't stay awake during the day, um, that really you know, what you should be asking for is a referral to someone who actually does know how to ask the proper questions to get to whether or not there is a diagnosis. I mean, patients will often, and, and even providers will say, well, I don't want to refer to sleep medicine because they, they just diagnose everybody. Well, the reason why rates of diagnosis are so high in sleep disorder centers is because it takes so much to get a referral that by the time by the time the referral comes in, it's it's not only just a sure thing; it's been a sure thing for years. It's not even a question anymore. Um, I would say it would be great if sleep disorder centers start sending people back saying, "No, you don't test positive for any of these things." Um, it's just the threshold is so high. So I, I would actually challenge patients and and to talk to their providers and challenge the providers too to lower their threshold when to refer to sleep medicine or behavioral sleep medicine to actually get these things correctly identified early. I mean, I love seeing, um, we do a little celebration whenever I see a new patient on our list who hasn't been bounced around the system for 20 years before they come in to see us, because that's usually what happens. So, so that, that I think is the first thing I wanna say. You don't have to know what all the symptoms are. Just know if there's something wrong, we know what questions to ask. But we can't find you unless you, um, unless we get that referral or someone sends you to one of us. That I think is probably going to be the best way, the best way forward to actually get that diagnosis. Yeah, you really have to be your own uh, self advocate in that situation. Really, um, sleep medicine in general is a relatively young field, and so in that sense, um, it's great. Tova, that your primary care doctor was uh, aware of narcolepsy as a diagnosis, um, but it's not always the case. And 
you know, sleep physicians, like Mike's, Michael said, um, we don't just diagnose sleep apnea, which is what people think of, but the, you know, uh, narcolepsy and restless leg syndrome and insomnia are really all fall within the, um, the rubric of sleep medicine that we, uh, we treat. I think, did you prematurely go out? Oh, no, I think that's all I had to say there. <laughs> okay. And, you know, we talk about self-advocacy and it's in the clinic, but also at the workspace, um, you know, in the workplace, how was it adjusting to like the narcolepsy and, um, you know, Tova, did you experience presenteeism, absenteeism, either being there and not being as productive as you could be or having to miss work? And how can we engage providers in getting some help there as well? So personally for me, I was in uh, financial services at the time um, and kept falling asleep in one-on-one -on -one meetings with clients. And it's really hard to convince someone that you're watching their investments when you're fast asleep in front of them. Um, so I actually ended up having to take a, a six week leave of absence um, and my employer, it was a major bank at the time, was, was very understanding. And that was to get my symptoms um, sort of under control, they told me. Um, but it, it was very helpful. It was a time that I could really spend um, on self-care and taking care of myself. But I realize not everybody has that luxury. When I returned, I had it in my plan that I needed to take daily naps, which is hard to do in an office setting. And I had to you know, go down to my car um, to take a nap. Um, so it's it doesn't always look perfect and it's not always uh, super supportive, but I just found sort of part of my unapologetic self-care. I had to be my own biggest advocate. And if employers were giving me a hard time, um, you know, I, I just have to sit down and try to educate them, um, try to share with them some Diff different resources that were available online. This narcolepsy toolkit will be a wonderful, wonderful asset to people in the workplace, shared with their employer, just to help educate people. And sometimes it's not going to work out. Sometimes it's not going to be the the best fit. And personally, for me, I ended up having to um, I ended up leaving financial services in the corporate world, and I now work for myself, and that work schedule works much better for me, um, but that was a long journey, too, but I, I definitely um, would recommend people try to educate others in the workplace. Yeah, there is a lot of stigma still, especially around sleep, and especially in some industries. Um, I find it very annoying that like if you had a different neurologically driven autoimmune disorder, um, there wouldn't so much be a question of like, oh yeah, sure, as long as you're able to do your job, we can make whatever accommodations. But sleep carries the stigma to it that that like you're lazy or whatever, and it, that's where the problems come. I think you're right, education is key, but sometimes it's not gonna work. You know, we can't convince everybody, I think. 10 years from now, it may be easier as more of these sorts of initiatives start percolating up in the system and people start hearing about this a little more. Um, it's And people know narcolepsy isn't just this cartoonishly funny thing that they see in movies. It's actually a, a legit medical issue that doesn't make you a bad person or a bad worker. Um, you can be really successful and good at your job while also having this sort of condition. And I think that's the attitude we need to pr project. We need to treat it just like any other sort of medical disability issue that doesn't interfere with your ability to do your job, but it might interfere with the ability of how you do your job. But not that you can. You know, it's the, you know, we talked about various things and, and it comes up, the symptoms, as you mentioned, they're similar between men and women, but women have this longer diagnostic process. And of course, responses, there are biological sex differences as far as um, responses to medications and treatments. Um, and so what 
role can you speak that estrogen plays in narcolepsy? And as a result, what are the changes? Do we see changes after menopause? I'd say yes for a number of reasons. The hormones do play a role. Um, we know that after menopause, um, women are at a higher risk of other sleep disorders as well. So they have a tendency um, for poor sleep. And then in addition to that, it changes the sleep patterns as well. So triggers might be different, um, just the way that they're responding to different cir circumstances, the amount of sleep that they need, all of that changes. So this lifetime pattern of knowing how to regulate their narcolepsy, now they have to come up with different uh, patterns, different times to sleep, maybe a different number of naps in the during the daytime, different timing of their medications, sort of overcome times that are particularly challenging for them. And even on the, oh, Tilda, did you have something you want to add? No. And I want us to take a moment to address cataplexy. I know it's a term that a lot of people probably aren't, they're not familiar with. Um, and it's not just a loss of muscle tone, but sometimes it can be an activation. And so what does it look like in reality, not necessarily this dramatized person falling in a moment of heightened emotion or something, but can you kind of talk about that and describe what does it really look like so that we have very level expectations of what it means when someone says they have cataplexy? So I, I can tell you personally, when, when I was diagnosed, I was experiencing a fuzziness on the left side of my face when I exercised and doctors were extremely perplexed as to what that was. And of course it caused me to get MRIs and everything. And it turned out in hindsight that that was a form of, of cataplexy. I was so proud of myself when I exercised that I uh, brought on cataplexy in myself. And just for some reason, it was only on the left side of my face and it was just a weird fuzzy feeling. Now, um, when I experience cataplexy, um, it's when my kids do something really cute. Um, my husband and I will be walking and the kids will do something. And I have this feeling of, oh, look how cute they are. And my knees will buckle and I look like I'm almost drunk. So it's, it's a very subtle thing. If people looked at me, they would just think I maybe tripped over something as I walked, but I could feel in my body that that was a, a cataplexy response. Personally, I have only dropped <laughs> to the floor uh, twice. And that was when my kids scared me. <laughs> we, we like to freak each other out. And I came around the corner and one of them jumped out and scared me and I dropped to the ground. So I got him. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, it looks different even throughout my lifespan. Halloween must be fun at your house. Yeah. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> Yeah, I think you highlight the fact that this isn't this isn't just one thing. Um, I've seen a whole range of things from patients, everything from I thought I was having a stroke to, you know, the, the it, sort of the, the embodiment of what we already have in our culture of sit down, I need to tell you something where like when they when they get confronted with something, they kind of need to sit, um, <laughs> you know, or it could be sort of like something where all of a sudden they know it's going to happen and then they 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 sort of deflate like a like a lawn balloon of a, you know where they they just sort of like sort of go down um, and it's also important to know that in cataplex cataplexy isn't sleep um, it's it's not wake either and and that's what makes it complicated and sometimes scary but there's a wide range of ways it can look and that's part of why it gets undiagnosed for so long because you go to your doctor and says yeah, when I sometimes I can't feel the left side of my face for a little bit, like the first thought isn't, ooh, this might be narcolepsy with cataplexy. It's like, mm, what's a, this some stuff of the neurological going on? I would love to dive in deeper, but I know we're coming to a bit of a close. 
So I want to ask um, one last question um, to each of you. And so we get patients and general audiences, we have researchers, healthcare providers, industry policymakers that all tune into our events. Uh, what is one takeaway you would recommend to these viewer groups to help them support women living with narcolepsy? And I'd even take it to a bit step further to take narcolepsy seriously when someone shares that they have it or is exploring it and not dismissing it as laziness or um, you need to get some more sleep or something like that to really be able to take it seriously and support women as they live with narcolepsy. And so I guess if we start with Vidya and then um, Michael, and then we can end with Toba. I think my advice would be to ask the woman, how can I be helpful? What can we do? I, you know, my experience with narcolepsy patients is that they're incredibly driven. They've been um, sort of hindered by their symptoms for so long, but they're motivated and they um, just need that support of being able to take a nap at work, um, schedule a, a time where they can do that, you know, adjust their schedule when they know that they have uh, triggers that might be um, causing some of their symptoms, but patients tend to know themselves the best. And so asking a woman with narcolepsy, um, how can I be accommodating, I think would be the most helpful. So I apologize in advance, this is a little controversial, but uh, I would I would challenge people if people are wondering how to to um, talk about this idea or embrace this idea. I would say, forget everything you think you know about narcolepsy. You've heard the word before, but you probably really don't know what it means. You think you do, but you don't. Let's start there, and then we'll say, narcolepsy is like remind people. Narcolepsy is a neurologically based autoimmune disorder that people can neither that people don't choose. They didn't, they didn't um, bad behavior their way into, it happened. And it, not, it affects neither their ability to be motivated, their ability to be effective, nor their intelligence. Um, but it does impact sometimes um, their ability to function in various moments. Um, what other neurological conditions do you see or do you think are laziness? If someone had a seizure disorder, where all of a sudden they'd had to make some accommodations to adjust for that seizure disorder. And if they had a seizure, um, no one would say, get up, like, stop it. Like, you're, you're just being lazy right now. No one would say that because we know what seizures are and we know not to hold people accountable for them. I, I think not saying narcolepsy is a seizure, but I, I think we need to approach it from this similar perspective of without judging people for it, accepting it for what it is and not trying to blow it into something it's not. I love that. I love that. Uh, personally, for me, I would say the the number one way you could you could help someone or support someone is is don't say, "Oh my God, I think I have that too. I get tired too. I fall asleep when I watch TV. Good for you, but I do it like at a pro level. You're just an amateur at it. But really, talk to the person. The number one thing I love is when people say, what does that mean to you? How does that affect you? And let me explain, not them telling me. So give me a chance to you know, tell them how they can help, but also just tell them how it affects my life. I think um, just listening, sometimes just being quiet and listening is really the best thing we can do. Thank you all so much. You've been an amazing panel and we thank you for your time and insight. And, you know, those wrap up um, comments were really, really key. Uh, we also like to thank Avidel and the Harmony Biosciences for their support of this event and SWHR's narcolepsy program. We could not do this work without the expertise and contributions of our science networks, particularly our narcolepsy working group members who contributed towards the development of SWHR's narcolepsy toolkit, a woman's empowerment guide that also um, features our three panelists today. Um, we will be sending out an email with a recording of today's event um, to all registrants, as well as a link to our narcolepsy toolkit. So please be on the lookout for that. 
Um, to all of our viewers, live and recorded, we invite you to connect with us on social media and visit our website, www.swhr.org, to register for future events, download other women's health resources, and sign up for our newsletter. Let's continue this important conversation with hashtag SWHR Talk Sleep. Thank you for joining us.